thank you for joining this call um, after this very remarkable uh, weekend um, that um, where Iran uh, telegraphed um, this extraordinary attack, meaning they announced it in advance and then went on to conduct the largest ever drone and missile attack strike on a, against a foreign nation. Um, we're going to let Ari Sasher, who's with us, talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes. Um, I just wanted to kind of give an overview of this war, its importance, and how we can participate at this time. And I want to thank all of you, USIA partners, intercessors, all those that are involved um, in this organization, because uh, we are actually at the tip of the spear. Uh, we have just returned from Israel uh, with a congressional delegation. Um, we were able to visit the primary uh, sites where this war is um, unfolding, and we were able to meet with the top leaders. And it was just an extraordinary, not just opportunity, but really an incredible responsibility. And so I want to just, uh, first of all, just um, say that, um, Ari, can you wave and say who you are? Hello, there's Ari Sasher, who's my longtime friend and our missile defense um, um, leader on our team. Um, he operates on Capitol Hill with us, but obviously Ari has been the chief engineer of what has become known as the famous Iron Dome Missile Defense System. And he has everything to say on the missile uh, Star Wars that we saw in Israel um, over the weekend. But before we start with him, I want to just give an overview of the war. And many of you are like, now, how did this happen? What in the world brought it to this point? And I just want to remind you that it was Israel's alleged strike on um, a building next to the Iranian consulate in Damascus that killed uh, the, the highest ranking Iranian military commander, uh, General Mohammad Reza Zahedi, um, a, a few weeks ago. And this alleged strike brought this to the brink where Iran decided to make a strike on Israeli soil. And so this was um, the first top leader since General Soleimani died in a drone strike on 2020, um, back in 2020 under Donald Trump. And this led to the response that we saw over the weekend. So just to be clear, there was an alleged Israeli strike that led to Iran's response. And Iran telegraphed the attack. Um, they conducted the largest drone and missile strike um, ever in their history. And if we could just go a little bit higher, I want to explain um, what uh, Minister Yoav Gallant helped us understand um, in our important meeting with him that lasted over an hour. I think he wanted us to understand the, 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 the reason for this war. What is the motive? Um, why, besides just the spiritual and biblical components, do we continue to see Israel at war with these proxies of Iran? What is their strategy? Because while they um, do have a medieval sort of philosophy uh, pl placating the religion on their nation, they do indeed have a cohesive strategy, which we are seeing, and it does seem to be working. So I want to talk about it for just a minute. I think that that um, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant did say it best. I think their aim is to destroy Israel from within. That is to remove Israel's deterrence, to erode their economy through battles of attrition, to crush their resolve, to want to stay in the land um, through just an ongoing uh, battle of rockets and terror. They have an entire generation that is now in war with Gaza a whole youth from age 20, 18 to 37 that are they're on the front lines of this war with their friends dying at war in um, Gaza and on the Lebanon border. And it has been like nothing we've ever seen. But if you can kind of imagine that Iran refuses to accept a Jewish state in the region, and hence they have formed what are called proxies. That is Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas in Gaza, Houthi rebels in Yemen, um, Iraq, Syria, Turkey, all of these nations involved with C Qatar financing all of the terrorist proxies alongside Iran. And Egypt, who has then facilitated the munitions and rockets across their border to Hamas for now decades. 
So it, is an, it has been a hurricane of onslaught from the Arab world with the aim to drive the Israelis out of their land. And I do think that's the thesis statement that we need to understand um, as we're watching the news, we're trying to figure things out. It becomes so complex that we just need to understand that is their resolve. They want the next generation of Israelis to say, ultimately, we don't want to raise our families in this environment. And I think if we understand that, then we can go on from there to understand the importance of our U.S. government, our House, our Senate, the role of a U.S. administration um, in trying to lead the world in the midst of this. And obviously, you, you know enough and care enough that you're on this call today, so you're reading the news. You see what's happening. And to this point, um, I think that uh, we are going to watch Israel probably respond uh, to Iran with some sort of painful um, response to them, but trying not to escalate the war too much. Obviously, Israel has to keep her deterrence, um, deterrence being the big D word, the most primary strategy for Israel and really um, even the, her, her, her enemies trying to, all of them trying to have their own deterrence in the region. Israel being uh, at a critical point of being able to have that deterrence um, the United States stepping in uh, to fight this war, which you'll hear from, Av from Ari in just a moment. But to this point, Israel has had pretty good tactical achievements in Gaza. They've been able to destroy mass infrastructure and tunnels, eliminating 18 of the 24 battalions of Hamas terrorists. But they have not yet been able to translate that into strategic successes yet. And that's going to be forthcoming. That's extremely important that they're able to do that in the eyes of the world, and the eyes of their nation. But with Hamas as an underground terrorist proxy, um, underground with tunnels, and UNRWA as the terrorist proxy above ground that has aided and abetted ha Hamas, it has been an extraordinary situation for Israel to deal with. So Israel will, once they have dealt with the Iranian situation, they are going to turn and then finish the effort in Gaza. And we need to understand the importance of not leaving Gaza unfinished. If you can imagine of the 18 to 24 battalions, you've got 8,000 terrorists that remain there. Well, that's too many. That's one too many because they could reconstitute and do this all over again in a number of years from now. So the idea is to destroy the Hamas leadership their ability to ever uh, do this again, to exile the remaining portion of, of the terrorists uh, to other lands, and to have a decisive um, somewhat victory there. And so I think that's what we understood uh, from the Israeli leaders. Uh, the defense minister said that once they do go into Rafah, that it will take two to three months um, of this major operation, and then at which point they will step down to lower operational efforts just to destroy pockets of resistance, and then we'll have to keep you posted beyond that because there's stages after that. I think what I'd like to point out this week um, is uh, besides the, the, the strategy that the Biden administration has had of appeasement and containment, which has not worked and has uh, continue to send the wrong message to Iran um, that they are winning, that they actually have immunity um, through this containment appeasement policy. Um, the Ayatollahs have read the American foreign policy correctly, and they have seen that they can produce this level of war. That is the bottom line. America and the world are going to need to shift their gears and change the way it confronts Iran. I think that um, one of the things to bring out today is you're gonna see the White House um, kind of debate back and forth over Israel's military response. Um, but ultimately, while pursuing diplomatic options, you need to look for what is President Biden doing to pursue these diplomatic possibilities. And you're gonna know if he's continuing to appease um, through his policies. Um, I think there are three decision points that he has to make as it concerns Iran. That is, will they lock down the 10 billion that they've already waived? If they've said you can have this 10 billion for humanitarian situations in your country. Um, if he would lock down the 10 billion, that would send a message. Will he crack down on the Iranian oil shipments to China through the international community? Will they come together and make a decisive end to 
to Iran's petroleum enterprise? Um, and then thirdly, will Biden work with the E3 to complete the snapback of uh, the UN sanctions, which would restore um, the embargo on their missiles and defenses? Um, very, very important. And, and I think this is, this is critical that all three of those things that we're able to see needs to change inside the administration's policy. Whether we will see that or not is yet to be understood. Um, I think there is pressure uh, for this U.S. administration to do something more. They're getting it from the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, in the House of Representatives this week, I was on the phone yesterday twice uh, with uh, Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, who is bringing to the docket um, onto the floor um, several important bills as it relates to Israel. One is the aid package for Israel to the tune of $14 billion. Um, and compromises are being made to get that bill through, um, successfully through the House and Senate this week. Very, very important is that will send an extremely uh, significant message to Israel of support. Um, and also to their um, their enemies. And then secondly, is the sanctions on Iran. We've talked to you about this before, but there is what is called the SHIP Act, um, and it is a sanction act. It, it, it puts um, penalties on anyone that buys or sells uh, oil or petroleum or ships oil and petro petroleum on behalf of Iran. So it is a thorough layered approach to the sanctions that too will be on the floor, um, House and Senate, that needs to pass. Um, and I think this is important that we see the uh, Congress succeed this week on behalf of the nation of Israel. Um, they are a balance of power to our US administration today, extremely important, the role that they're playing and the willingness of the Congress to play that role. As we sat with um, Speaker Amir Ohana, the Speaker of the Knesset um, last week, we were able to show him 22 pages. Now hear me, 22 pages of effort, line by line, resolutions, letters to the president, letters to the UN, bills, legislation, um, effort on behalf on, on the uh, on the effort on that the United that the United States House and Senate has put forth since October 7th on behalf of the state of Israel. Um, it is a strong show of support, and I believe we're going to see that again this week um, as the House and Senate members take a stand on behalf of Israel. This is important for those of you who hold and espouse to um, a biblical perspective of how we handle the state of Israel, that foreigners will rebuild your walls, O Israel, their kings will serve you. Though in anger I struck you with great compassion, um, will I bring you back and I will bring you the wealth of the nations, men coming in procession, kings through the gates of Jerusalem. For the nation that will not serve you, O Israel, will perish and be utterly destroyed. And this was the prophecy of Isaiah out of chapter 60, verse 10. And on and on he goes to announce that the kings would be coming to Israel. And so I want to just sort of close my part by saying I want us to look up and to understand that we're calling on God to intervene in these circumstances, to open the way for our leadership in the United States to take a robust stand for Israel at this time. We certainly backed her over the weekend in this war um, with our efforts, which you're going to hear from Ari. But I want us to, to see us go to another level of this, the, the Biden administration stepping in to help put sanctions back on Iran at this time, which is the head of the octopus. So thank you for being with us, Ari. I'd love to go to you now to talk a little bit about this war we saw over the weekend, this Star Wars in the sky, rather amazing. Thank you, Ari Sasher, for leading the way on the Iron Dome missile defense system. Thank you, Heather. Um, what we saw on Saturday night was simply unprecedented. It was 30 years in the making. I remember in 1991, um, we were just been in Israel for 10 years, a young couple, and we're sitting in our apartment in, in, in Haifa, and we, we heard that Saddam Hussein threatened to uh, fire missiles on us. 
on um, January the 15th, because that's when the uh, the ultimatum expired. Uh, President Bush's, uh, the father's uh, ultimatum expired. And we began sweating ever more profusely, but we thought to ourselves, they would never, ever shoot at us because if they tried shooting at us, then we would respond with, with such vim and vigor that they would rue the day that they ever fired at us. Lo and behold, January the 15th came and they fired Scud B missiles all over Israel, guided missiles at the heart of our uh, population centers in Tel Aviv, Ramat Gan. Um, thankfully, uh, no one was killed. Uh, it was it was definitely um it, it was definitely uh, in, in my opinion an, an act of God how 39 of these missiles fell and 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 no one was killed but we understood we had a problem and this problem was that our urban areas had become targeted and we believed that they would become targeted in the future and so state of Israel set out to build a multi-layer missile defense system what is a multi-layer missile defense system well it turns out that shooting down a missile is not as easy as it sounds. For me, I'm a rocket scientist, sounds pretty easy. But it, it turns out that it is a bit more difficult. How so? It turns out that the further a missile flies, faster it goes. It's like throwing a ball. The further you throw the ball, then the faster it goes. If you want to throw the ball from the pitcher's mound to home plate, and anybody can throw that. Uh, a former presidents do it all the time on opening day. But if you want to peg a guy out from shortstop, you're going to have to throw further. And if you want, if there's a, a high fly to the right field corner, and you want to get a guy who's tagging up, and you want to throw it home, then you're going to throw that ball harder, higher, and faster. Just the way things fly. And conversely, the harder, higher, and faster you throw a ball, the more difficult it is to catch. Same thing with rockets the further you fire a rocket the fur the, the faster it's got to go the higher it's got to go and the more difficult it is to intercept we understood that we have people from all around us who want to share the love israel is uh, just that kind of country we we beckon Throw, throw your rockets at us. We have people that live close to us, people in Lebanon and, and Gaza, people that live further, Syria, points east, Iran. And we understood, Iraq, obviously, all the first guys who fired at us, and we understood that we had to build a system, an integrated system that would be able to manage, to deal with all of these threats. And the way we did it was we divided the sky into levels. The lowest level is the level um, of things that are coming from about up to oh, 40 or so miles out. Um, that is the bailiwick of a system called Iron Dome. That's the easy stuff. That's the stuff coming from Gaza. That's the stuff coming in the uh, landing in the north where I live from um, from places like uh, uh, Lebanon or Hezbollah uh, owns and operates um, Iran's uh, favorite proxy. They, five years in a row, their favorite proxy award. Um, beyond Iron Dome, if it's coming in further than about 40 miles out, then it's coming a bit too difficult for Iron Dome. So there's another system that is above Iron Dome, and that is called David's Sling. And David's Sling is designed to take out rockets that are coming further than the ones that Iron Dome can take out. Obviously, if Iron Dome can take out the rocket, we want to um, take it out with Iron Dome and not David Sling, because you will see that the more difficult it is to catch a ball, the more expensive it is to catch a ball. And these systems cost almost exponentially more uh, than the ones lower than that. Uh, David Sling costs significantly more than, uh, than an Iron Dome interceptor. There are some uh, weapons that are coming in too high and too fast for David Sling. So they're in the bailiwick of what we call Arrow 2. The Arrow 2 system produced by um, Israel Aircraft Industries. Above Arrow 2 is Arrow 3. And Arrow 3 actually intercepts targets in outer space. He leaves the atmosphere, goes into outer space. And all of these systems gradually have been lined up to protect the state of Israel. The first system out there is actually Arrow 2, followed by Iron Dome, followed by David Sling, followed by Arrow 3. And actually, they're working on Arrow 4 right now that can protect against even more difficult threats. Mm -hmm. Well, on Saturday night, we were totally taxed. We were fired upon only by ballistic weapons from Syria, from Iraq, 
from Iran, from the, the South, from the Houthis in, in Yemen, a whole assortment of ballistic rockets. Um, the, the, I think the smallest warhead was about a half a ton of high explosives. A half a ton of high explosives falling in your home will put a crimp in your afternoon uh, or your, your evening, uh, as, as, as far as we were concerned. And there were those ballistic missiles coming in. The, Iran the Iranians also fired uh, what's called suicide drones. And these are smaller uh, jets that are carrying smaller warheads. They also fired what's called cruise missiles. And cruise missiles are a sort of suicide drone, but they're sleeker and they fly lower and they fly faster. And we had to take all of these things out. Now, not only do we have to use our systems, our four systems that are up and running, Iron Dome, David Sling, Arrow 2, and Arrow 3, but there is another way to skin the cat, especially the cat of, uh, of suicide drones. We in Israel have never faced a, such a huge swarm of suicide drones, and the answer to the uh, suicide drone problem is actually by using good old-fashioned airplanes, F-15s, F-16s, F-35s, that were armed by air-to-air -air missiles by spare by um, uh, amrams by sidewinders by um, uh, python fives and these were used also to take out and there's a lovely lovely video i mean for me it's lovely lovely video of these airplanes taking out these drones now not only was israel taking out the drones but other countries were taking out the drones as well it was clear the iranians as heather said to telegraph their move we knew it was going to happen the country was nearly in hysteria just waiting for the boot to drop and when it did we had assistance we had assistance from the americans there were 12 f-15 fighters that were flown in on saturday afternoon from the uk there are british uh, euro fighters that are floating around that part of the world in um based in um uh, in 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 the east there were also apparently jordanian fighters that were shooting down missiles now the jordanians announced not only that their fighters were shooting down missiles that were flying over sovereign jordanian territory which it had every right to, to shoot at not only did they shoot them down but a, a news article came out uh, earlier uh, i believe yesterday that the princess the daughter of uh the the king uh, abdallah and um and uh, princess rania that she actually shot down five drones in her f-16 when that news hit the media um, there were riots in Jordan, and the um, the royal palace was forced to retract the article. My daughter shoot down missiles, <laughs> not me. She was watching television all night. At any rate, there were a lot of countries that were working together. Not only that, but. Israel has radars that operate at a certain distance and a certain um, altitude. Because of the curvature of the Earth, we can't see what's going on too low, far away, such that we had no idea. We couldn't have used our radars to figure out that the, um, the Iranians had fired off their uh, weapons. It was clear that we were getting data from other countries. Which other countries? I don't know. But what we had was a case of a multi-layer, multi-nation, integrated air and missile defense. And all of this is being controlled somehow. I mean, it's as if these people had actually practiced it before because everybody needs to know which threat they're going to take. I can't have two jets taking the same threat because there's gonna be a threat without a jet and the two jets might shoot each other down. And yet all of this operated flawlessly. I don't mean flawlessly, I mean 99% of what was fired at us was either shot down or hit areas that we didn't care about. The only thing that did hit Israel was one ballistic missile with a very large warhead, I believe 1,800 um, uh, kilos, which is um, it, it's close to two tons of a warhead, and that hit an Air Force base, the Nevatim Air Force Base, where, by the way, F-35 Squadron is based. It hit near a runway. It made this huge hole in the ground and um and that was it and mm. i can tell you from a spectator who knows way too much and not nearly enough about what's going on over his head 
I went to sleep on Saturday night when I heard that the um, the drones had been launched before the uh, the um, ballistic missiles had been launched. We knew the ballistic missiles were going to be launched. The idea was to make make sure everything comes in at the same time, and the ballistic missiles fly so much faster than the drones. I went to bed confident. Hmm. I went to bed saying um, the the twentieth psalm. God should answer us in times of, um, of, of, of adversity. And I woke up and ball game was over. And from we switched from the 20th Psalm. We jumped to the uh, 100th Psalm, a, a Psalm of, of thanks. What happened was unprecedented. Mm. Uh, and the question is, what happens next? Right. And um, I believe what's going to happen next is not what should be happening next. I believe that the um, the Iranian hospital this morning, given blood, and a man had lost it. The um, I, I believe that um, the Iranians have been led off by the U.S. and the European nations with a uh, with a stern tongue lashing. I don't want to see you ever do that again. If you ever fire missiles at Israel again, we're going to be extremely angry. A country fired off 60 tons of high explosives on the sovereign state of Israel. The cost of defending against these weapons costs only the state of Israel on the order of a half a billion dollars. This is what it costs to defend against the drones, the, the ballistic missiles specifically, because it's much, they're, they're much more expensive to defend against and to keep our jets flying in the air for six hours. And one would expect Israel would have the right to fight back. And yet the United States has told Israel to, uh, I quote, take the W, just uh, just take the win. If Iran understands that Iran can get off with uh, shooting a huge volley of weapons at Israel, regardless of what the outcome is, and it can get off with a, with a tongue lashing, and Israel is being told to stand down, then this is a critical loss of deterrence, not only of the state of Israel, which cannot defend itself, uh, which is content to um, walk out with a huge suit of armor and take a slug at me, take a slug at me. You won't be able to beat me. You won't be able to beat me, but we won't be able to beat you. There is nothing that we can do to prevent them from doing this again if we do not hit back. It's a loss of deterrence, not only of the state of Israel, it is a loss of deterrence of the United States of America and of the uh, European nations, which are also forcing our hand. Mm. So if you ask how I'm feeling in Israel, on the one hand, I'm feeling ecstatic because what we lived through was um, salvation. I mean, that's, that's really the only way to describe it, to see what happened and, and to understand what happened and how, um, how in danger we were and how within six hours the tables have completely turned. On the other hand, I am uh, angry at um, Israel's being limited to uh, defend itself, but I'm hopeful because I believe that state of Israel and its allies, United States especially, and Europe, understand the threat, understand the Iranian threat. I believe that we can reach an understanding on how to deal with the Iranian threat that um, de-escalation is not necessarily the best way ahead. Mm -hmm. I believe that Israel will come out on top. Um, we are seeing tectonic changes. I can't describe how and why they're happening when this all started on October the 7th. Um, but I believe that at the end of the day, when this is all over, and I do not know when this is all over, I do not know if we are in the beginning of the Israeli-Iranian war or at the end, of the first Israeli-Iranian war, that the situation will be infinitely better than it was before. I'm going to hand the ball back to uh, to Heather. Yeah, great. Well, um, Ari, talk a little bit for one minute just about how we have over the last 10 years, because we've played a pretty major role, USIEA has, in the development of the missile defense collaboration. And, you know, watching, I remember uh, taking Mac Thornberry uh, to Israel, he was the chairman on armed services, and he had determined that he was not going to test the Arrow 3 missile defense system over Alaska, that he did not think that, that was a wise investment of money and that Israel should be able to handle that. 
and over the course of a week, taking him to see it, understanding it, um, and then kind of talking him down from that ledge, he agreed to finance out of the armed services uh, the $100 million testing of the Arrow 3, and we saw the Arrow 3 in operation in this war. Um, absolutely amazing. And so, Ari, talk a little bit about our history. USIEA has, as from the app, the first time I I was ever introduced to USIEA was from was was when um, when Heather brought first tour and it was led by um, by Doug Lamborn who was at the time the uh, the chair of the House Armed Services Committee and and um, and we went to see Iron Dome and this was no uh, trivial matter I believe Heather went to um, Prime Minister Netanyahu when the group went to meet him and the, the system was classified at the time I, rem I remember that Iron Dome's first intercept was in um, April of uh, of 2011 and this was only a couple of months afterwards and uh, as as only Heather can do, she convinced the uh, the prime minister to let the uh, the members see the system. And when you see the system and you learn about the system and you understand the system, then it is compelling, compelling to the point that the U.S. has uh, supported the system to date to to uh, the tune of greater than one point six billion dollars to soon to turn into um, the two point six billion dollars. And, and who knows what's going to happen after this war? Um, USIEA was um, uh, brought uh, myself and uh, the head of the Israel Muslim Defense Organization to D.C. Uh, to speak about um, Iron Dome, about David Slink, so that the members could understand what I'm teaching you right now. And, and when you hear hear about it and you understand it and it's presented to them in a way that that they can they can compare it to things that they know then the issue is compelling i think the uh the um the, the uh feather in our cap is really the uh the, the flight test of arrow three israel cannot test um arrow three the way we want to test it because of the way we are the way the are geographically located we have to fire all our missiles to the west and we're firing it over the Mediterranean Sea where there are boats and there are airplanes and we're severely limited. The only way we could really test the system. And in Israel, when we test the system, we test the system with a ragged edge of our envelope. And we couldn't test it in Israel. We didn't know what our system was really capable of doing. And the only way that we could really find out what the system was made of was by testing it in Alaska. And uh, there was a lot of blowback from Congress, but talking to the right people and introducing the right people and explaining it to them, which, which is what USIEA did, we stem the tide and turn the tide. And the, the, um, the United States Congress supported the, the flight test. And here we are where we are. Um, we have been protected as of two days ago by, uh, by Arrow 3. And, uh, and thank God for that. We're going to keep on doing what it is they're doing, keep on pounding the pavement and explaining to people what's going on in ways that they can understand, ways that they will find compelling. And we will push collaboration. It's not um, you're giving us money and we're using it. It's collaboration because these uh, this, this technology is coming right back to the United States and to its allies. Mm -hmm. So good. Well, Ari, thank you for that. It seems to yeah. me that, um, it, that Israel is going to have to respond um, to Iran I think they have a um, a large goal at this point to finish what they have started in Gaza to get the hostages home. So they are dealing with now two situations that are enormously uh, significant uh, to their um, to their to the population of Israel, to the families there. And um, I believe that this organization is taking um, a, an extremely important role, influentially, on Capitol Hill uh, with our education. As we were just in Israel, I'd like to let you know that we were able to make an announcement in the Knesset <laughs> on the day of the Abraham Accords commemoration. Uh, we had Senator Lankford with us, who is the chairman of the, of the um, Abraham Accords caucus in the Senate. And we had Randy Weber, who co-sponsored the legislation uh, for putting an FDA bureau in the region of the Abraham Accords in order to diversify American supply chains, pharmaceutical supply chains outside of China, with a look to that staging ground to be able to produce and collaborate together. Uh, Ron Dermoth, the strategic affairs minister closest to Netanyahu said, if we could get that done this year, it would be a shot in the arm for the beleaguered state um, of the Abraham Accords at this time. 
and it would be a way forward for us to collaborate on such an important uh, situation for the United States. So we're look, we were able to make the announcement that that's happening, uh, that the Congress is moving forward to legislate on that matter, and um, that we're hoping to have a great victory uh, in 2024. So that was good. And the second thing I think that I'd like you to know is that the, uh, the, the, the leaders of Israel's country want pressure on Qatar. They are the ones brokering, trying to get the hostages back, um, either through a carrot or a stick. Uh, the members of Congress are about to roll over Qatar and their leadership and put in, incredible pressure on them. Uh, to be able to release the, to put the pressure on Hamas to give up the hostages. Uh, we may see something forthcoming here soon. And then lastly, um, the importance of defunding UNRWA, that is the United Nations Relief Works um, Agency, who has turned into a terrorist proxy, or they have had that impulse from the beginning to keep a refugee status in perpetuity there to indoctrinate an entire generation to hate Israel, to destroy Israel. That UNRWA is coming to an end for all purposes with the United States, but it's not just enough to defund it. We've put the proposal out there for the United States to lead the way in bringing the Arab nations together to detoxify that educational process um, and to uh, bring Saudi Arabia into the picture, the UAE, who have scrubbed their education systems clean of anti-Semitism and, and uh, you know, Jewish tropes. And so it's been effectively done. We're going to now have to see it in Gaza and under the Palestinian Authority. So I just want to thank you all for um, being with us. Uh, Coach Bruce Pearl, my, one of my favorite advocates, um, is with us on, online, my favorite coach of basketball. Good to see you, Bruce. <laughs> Good to see you too, Heather. Good to see you too, Heather. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. We can hear you. Go ahead. Well, thank you for, you know, leading this call. I think uh, um, I think everybody was somewhat comforted yesterday to receive an email from USIA saying that we we're going to get a chance to see Ari and make sure that he's okay and that he's that he is safe and give us an update on his family and and everything. And and uh, he means so much to all of us and. You know, he's out there, he's in the fight. Um, and I guess um, I guess what we're doing at USIA, it's, it's, it's kind of never been more important. Um, you know, Ari talks about the deterrence. And, um, you know, what has deterred Israel's enemy from destroying her since she was created? And um, there may have, there may not have ever been a time like the present when there's less deterrence now than maybe Mm -hmm. maybe ever, or maybe when she first was born, um, right. to have uh, experienced October 7th and the murders and the rape and the torture and the kidnapping. Um, and then on top of that, to have experienced April 13th in an unprecedented attack, and yet still having many in the world, and including the Biden administration, uh, really place limits on how Israel is able to defend itself and broadcast that out to the free world, which takes away the threat of the deterrence that would prevent so many of Israel's enemies who hate her from going about what they've always wanted to do. And that is to destroy her. And so it's a, it's a really, really difficult, obviously difficult time. Um, but through the efforts of USIA to have educated Congress um, thank God we have that balance of power, which is so vital in our in our system of government. And um, it's being tapped into and it's being called upon and it's it's worked. Um, you know, thank God for the United States military and our servicemen and women who are stationed there and 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 were heroes on Saturday and the IDF. And thank God for some of the other countries, including including countries like Jordan. Who is a neighbor? Who isn't all? We're not always sure where they're at with things, but you know what? For whatever reason, they they stepped up that night and allowed. Not only did she go to work in defending, but she allowed Israel to do what needed to do. You know, there are a lot of positive things, and Heather's always looking, you know, at the positive things. She's always looking at, um, you know, what 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 where can we go from here? 
And 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 at least on Saturday night, the world stepped up and and defended Israel. And then now Ari said, okay, you know, where 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 obviously do we go, you know, from here? Um, I think the efforts of USIA continue to educate Congress, continuing to educate Israel's allies, people here at home, people that are allies around the world, still need to be educated both through the Bible and through Scripture, as as well as the realities on the ground. And then and then taking it a step further by even trying to educate Israel's enemies and and seeing if somehow this can all be a launching pad for for peace but we are clearly in a crossroads um and so i think we know what the, we know the work that we need to all do and i think we all need to go forward and the last thing that's probably the most important thing is god is on our side mm. god is with us and i was reading amos uh amos 9:15 and god said i will plant israel in their own land never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. And so we are doing, we're in the middle of doing God's work. And um, and I just want to thank the people that are on the call uh, for supporting USIEA and, and, and thank Ari for, you know, for being such a brilliant, incredibly talented, ridiculously funny rocket scientist uh, who's on our side. Um, and, uh, and, um, Thank you, Heather, for keeping us uh, up to speed, up to date. You know what, Bruce, it's so interesting. It was pointed out to me um, just th this morning that when this attack occurred, it was on 413, April 4, April um, the 13th. So 413. And if you look at the book of Esther, which is dealing with Iran, uh, the kingdom of Persia, which is Iran, um, chapter four and verse 13 says, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at a time, at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your family, father's family will perish. And who knows, but that God, that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And I really believe that is the mission of USIEA, US Israel Education Association, that call to be in the King's house, influencing, educating, and opening the way for deliverance. And um, I'm so honored. It's just amazing that verse. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> it, it is. Now, now, Heather, who who spoke that verse? Was that was uh, that Lou Esther's Engel. uncle Mordechai? <laughs> Lou Engel sent that to me. But, but anyway, who, who actually spoke? Yeah, he's got I know, a, but, he's got but a I mean, who, who, who's Mordecai, Bruce? Yeah, Mordecai. It was Mordecai. It was Mordecai who said that to Esther. Yep, right. that's right. And so it it, it was um, it was incumbent upon Esther and Mordecai and that company who were at their, their time to stand up to Persia, that is Iran, and that destiny remains over Iran, that government. And I'm not saying it's over the people because I believe the people want to be liberated and will be. Um, but I think that, that that government has a destiny and it is not a good one. So anyway, I want to um, just close by Stacy Ryan. Are you there for us? I'm um, here. Close us out. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you all so much for joining us uh, where, wherever you are from morning or evening. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for your time. Uh, there's about a hundred of you guys who I believe are somewhat new to us. If you're not aware of who we are, we are USIA, the U.S. Israel Education Association. We are a small, nimble, efficient 501c3 located in Alabama, and um, we're we're thankful for your time. We're especially thankful for your support. Many of you support us. Um, and we want to stress the urgency for the continuance of funding. We cannot operate without you. We want to continue educating Congress about uh, the importance of this collaboration, why we exist and our, our mission. We want to continue to do the research and state the facts and not get caught up in 
uh, the hype and anything else that you see out there. And so we're so thankful for this amazing group of individuals that you've heard from this morning who continue to state those facts and keep us well educated and keep us going on those congressional tours that we've just wrapped up. What a time that they have just returned uh, back to the U.S. and are well informed about what we're doing and are already um, out making speeches and uh, educating fellow members of Congress about how to act um, and find uh, pro-Israel um, issues. And so if you will go to our website, that is usieducation.org. On the donate tab, you're able to give uh, a one-time gift as much as you'd like, or you can sign up for monthly giving. That is what keeps our door open. And so we really appreciate your help in supporting us. And we want to continue um, this conversation with you. We thank you so much for your comments in the chat. And we want to make sure that we are addressing all of those too. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your financial contribution and your prayers. Yes. Well, thank you, Stacey. Thank you. And we look forward to keep you, keeping in touch with you and keeping you informed um, as events unfold. Um, we ask for your prayers to be watchmen on the wall at this time on behalf of our government, um, that we'll be doing the right things, at least out of our Congress and Senate, but hopefully out of our leadership, that we will stand with Israel through this very, very difficult season all the way to the end until they have completed their operations and their efforts against Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran. Thank all of you for being with us.